Lord this morning. Susan's children, and uh, so uh, <laughs> she was her firstborn, right? And uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, he is sick this morning. Been prayer for him as he's running the temperature, not feeling well. Also, Denise has been having some health issues for the last few weeks. Was at the doctor this past week, still battling some health issues there. So you pray for Pastor Ernie here in town uh, from the cancer surgery they, they did behind his eye. They will be going forward with treatments. Austin is sick this morning. Uh, Ruthie has some tests coming up this week, right? And uh, just be in prayer for her and uh, be in prayer for those. Also be in prayer for the Baileys. Many of you would remember Dan and Anna Bailey, those that lived here and came to our church for a number of years. Uh, they moved, oh, probably four years ago now uh, to Paradise, California. If you've seen any news at all the last few days, Paradise was completely destroyed by the fire. Uh, the town is completely gone. And uh, so we have not been able to contact Dan and Anna. We've tried by uh, by text, by phone call, things like that. We're hoping that's just because of the towers down and things. Yeah. But that fire is very, very devastating right now. That's what's known as the Camp Fire in Northern California, but there's also others burning down towards Hollywood and Southern California in that area there. So be in prayer for these folks that are affected by that. Thousands of people, literally thousands of people, tens of thousands actually, are affected right now by their homes being destroyed. As of this morning, the last count that I heard was 25 lives were lost thus far, mm -hmm. just in the northern fire, the camp fire, uh, up in northern California there. So a lot of different things going on. So be in prayer for the Baileys and their families. Not only did they have a home, but just a year or two ago, their daughter brought a home right across the road from them. Uh, so you be in prayer for this and, and these families there that we know. And we've got several things going on there. Let's be in prayer for these. Let's pray right now as for his blessing upon the day. Lord, we come to you at this time. We thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for the day you've given us and the opportunity to be in, in, in a country, Lord, we can come and assemble ourselves together. Lord, here it is, Veterans Day weekend, Lord, and, and we're going to be recognizing our veterans, Lord. We thank you this morning for those that served today, those that served in the past. And, Lord, now here we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of, of the First World War. And, Lord, how, how now we have faced so many different challenges and our country has gone through and Lord, you've allowed us to continue to be blessed and, and prosper, Lord. And I ask you now, Lord, to help us have our hearts move back towards you. As there are so many different things, Lord, that have caused us to get our uh, eyes off of you. Our hearts have been hardened. Our, our mindset uh, is worldly. So, Lord, I pray today as we gather together in this place that we would be convicted, that we would be challenged by the Holy Spirit, Lord, to realize what you've done for us. Lord, not just in this country and the blessings we have there, Lord, but at Calvary and 
Lord, how you die, bleeding and dying there provided salvation for all who believe, Lord. So I ask you today to help us to understand. Lord, if we know you as our Savior, Lord, those that do, I pray that you'd help us to realize the urgency of the hour that we're living in. Uh, that eternity hangs in the balance for our family and our friends and our loved ones. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be a witness to them. And, and Lord, to realize that as our life goes forward, that you would be used in our life if we would just allow you to. Lord, if we live our life separated and holy, pleasing unto you, Lord, that you would speak through us. And Lord, for those that are lost, those, Lord, that we... Uh, that, we're, that we're uncertain of where else we eternity. Lord, help us to be faithful in our witness that they may see you and know you, Lord, and they will be convicted and come to know you before it's eternally too late. Lord, for those that maybe be wayward or backward or backslidden, Lord, that they, they've trusted you, Lord, but their life has been choked by the pleasures of this world. The thorns and the thistles have taken away the pleasure of the Lord, glory of the Lord, Lord, but the pleasures of this world have taken over and they have no witness of you, Lord. I pray that you convict them this morning, Lord, help us to realize our place in the very body of Christ. Lord, for those that are sick this morning, I pray that you touch their bodies, strengthen and heal them. Those that's away from us, bring them back to us. We pray for Lex and Uni as they continue to prepare to move this week, to help them physically, emotionally, spiritually, Lord. I pray for traveling mercies as they're, for them and their belongings as they're going to be relocating to Washington State. For those affected there by the wildfires in California, Lord, I ask you to touch and comfort them. Uh, thousands of homes are destroyed. The possessions of the world are gone. But Lord, those that still have their lives, Lord, help them to realize your mercy and your grace in times like this. And for those that have lost family members, Lord, help them to realize that you're still on the throne, Lord, and you can save if they'll just call upon you. And if they have called upon you, Lord, help them to use this time to move through their life into the lives of others. Lord, for our veterans this morning, not only in this place, but around our country, those around the world, Lord, we thank you for the military power that we have, the strength that you've enabled us to have and victories that you've given us. Protect them. Give them guidance, Lord. Assure them this morning, Lord, that you love them. And, Lord, I pray that you move in their hearts and let them, Lord, be thankful for the country we've got to serve and help us, Lord, to be thankful for those that serve. We'll give you all the privilege, all the grace, all the glory this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, do keep your hymnal, though. Sing with us once again. And turn over to 562 this morning, 562. Uh, I'm on the winning side, 562 as we sing this this morning, all right? Once I drifted out in sin, had no hope nor joy within, and my soul was burdened down with pride. Savior came along and he showed me I was wrong. Now I know I'm on the winning side. Well, I'm on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. Out in sin, no more will I. Lord, I'm on the winning side. From the straight and narrow way, I was drifting every day. Out upon the water deep and wide. But it all is over now. Glory light is on my brow. And my soul is on the wind. Since I gave him full control And he placed me on the winning side Well, I'm on the winning side Yes, I'm on the winning side Out in sin no more will I abide I've enlisted in the fight For the cause of truth and right Praise the Lord, I'm 
on the winning side. All right, thank you for that. Amen. Now, do be in prayer for one another. We mentioned Lex and Jeannie going to be leaving out. Uh, they're hoping to get going on Wednesday, right? And uh, so be in prayer for them as they still got some packing and things to do. If they're anything like my wife and I, they'll be packing even after the truck is gone. And uh, so, uh, and, and so you've been, the truck leaves on Tuesday. So, and then part of the stuff leaves tomorrow. So you be in prayer for them as they're going to be uh, finishing up. You be in prayer for them. They're going to be with us tonight. They're not with us this morning. They're trying to work on some things this morning. So be in prayer for that. We're going to have a little going away party for them after the service tonight. So if you can come and be here and hang out with them just for a few moments, tell them bye, thank them for being here, the time that we've got to spend with them for the last few years. So be sure and plan on doing that after the service tonight. We mentioned uh, this past week they actually had an anniversary, uh, so we'll be wishing them a anniver happy anniversary tonight as well. And uh, they were packing on their anniversary day. And uh, so uh, uh, you'd be in prayer for them as they got a lot of things up and going. And then be in prayer for these birthdays and anniversaries this month. We also we mentioned Miss Denise, who had a birthday uh, this past week, but she's sick this morning, so be in prayer for her. And Eric had one week before. Uh, right after the service today, uh, we have a spe something special lined up for Thanksgiving this year. We've done various things over the years, from a meal for our church a few times to going out in the community, passing out food. So this year we're doing something a little different yet again. And uh, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to be gathering up names. If you have the names of legitimately people that's legitimately in need, uh, whether it be physical needs, financial needs, whatever the case may be, uh, we want you to submit those names to us, all right? And we want to help them if we can for Thanksgiving. Uh, if you would like to help us with that, we want you to do, be part of that. Uh, right after the church today, Eric is going to be down front. We'll just have him sit here behind the organ or something like that. If you wouldn't mind uh, coming and meeting with him just for a moment, he'll give, kind of give you some instruction. And basically what we're going to boil down to is this. He just needs to get your names so we can organize it better. What we're going to do is... We're going to buy some turkeys, however many we need for the whatever family names are submitted. We're going to provide them turkeys. We're going to cook them. And so if you want to help by cooking a turkey, we have a roaster you can use if you don't have one. If you want to cook it in the oven, whatever the case may be, you'll need to cook it during the night, Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, so it can be ready to go that morning. And then that morning, we will be also be cooking some sides and things like that if you want to help prepare some of the side dishes that morning. Uh, you can do that at your home or here, whatever the case may be. But we'd like you to kind of show up here about 8.30 uh, that morning, those of you that can also bring the food in. But if you can stay, we, we, we need some people to help serve the food, dish the food out, put it on some plates, put some aluminum foil on it. And then we'll need some runners, people to take it out, deliver it to the homes, visit with the people for a few moments, wish them a happy Thanksgiving, and just encourage them. So we want to do that. And we would like to start delivering the food about 10 o'clock that morning, so they'll all have it before noon. So if you can help us with that. So that would be wonderful and great. So you let us know that if you have names of families, we need those names along with how many people that's in that household so we can prepare the proper amount of food. If you want to help us by cooking the food, serving the food, covering the food, delivering the food, whatever the case may be, Eric will be right down front right here after the service if you'll come and give him just a few moments to get your names, and then we'll be properly assigning that uh, and giving you the information here in the next week so you can get that done. And we'll provide the turkeys. If you don't, want to, if you don't have the money to do that, we'll provide the turkeys for you to cook. If you'll help us out by cooking the meals, the side dishes and things like that, desserts, whatever the case may be, that'd be wonderful so we can help these people out. Amen? And it's a great time of year. Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. My wife loves Christmas and all the decorations and things. Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. You say, why? I'm a turkey. And uh, so uh, uh, I love Thanksgiving. You know why I love Thanksgiving? No joke. It's the one time of year where people come together expecting nothing. We used to get together at my grandmother's every year for Thanksgiving. Both grandparents, right? One for lunch, one for supper. And every year, and we'd come together, and people, kids weren't expecting gifts. People weren't expecting gifts. You didn't have to, it just, people just got together as a family. And you know what my, one of my favorite parts of that was, too? We ate things that we didn't eat any other time of the year. How many of you realize they sell turkeys like in February and June? I love turkey. Cranberry sauce, uh, you know, green beans, stuffing, dressing. Anytime you want to, if you want Thanksgiving like in, in pie, if you want to make Thanksgiving in May, invite me. I'll come eat it with you, all right? And, uh, and uh, we'll have a great time. Come over forward, gentlemen, if you would, and we'll have a great time. So if you, could, if you wouldn't mind hanging around just for a couple minutes after church, giving Eric your name, we can properly assign you to that uh, spot. 
And you'll help us out with that by cooking the turkeys, cooking the side dishes, preparing the food, serving the food, delivering the food, whatever. Say, I want to do all of it. Well, that'd be great, too. He'll put your name down in every spot, right? And uh, it would be a great thing to show our love for our community. That'll be on Thanksgiving morning. And we want to start delivering the food about 10 o'clock so everyone has it by 11, 11 15 or something like that so you can have it for lunch. And they can eat it when they get it. They can say whatever they want to do. But we want to provide that for them. So if you can help us out, that would be wonderful. Amen? Rick, if you would ask for his blessing upon the offering this morning. you've given me you were my friend when no one cared I was alone but you were there Lord you're the best thing that's ever happened to me and I owe it all to you Lord all I have is yours Lord take my life Make it what you'd have it be. I'm your child and you're my father. I'm the clay and you're the potter. Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. Borrow treasures, borrow dreams. All life's joys you've given me. When troubles come, you're always there to make me smile. So come what may, thy will be done. I love you, Jesus, God's only Son. Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I owe it all to you, Lord. All I have is yours, Lord, take my life, make it what you'd have it be. I'm your child and you're my father, I'm the clay and you're the potter, Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. I'm your child and you're my father, I'm the clay, and you're the potter, Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me.
I would encourage you to be in prayer for uh, one another, not just the Baileys there, but be in prayer for uh, the families of California. Many, many, many homes uh, destroyed. Uh, uh, everything that people often have worked their entire life for is gone in a moment. Be in prayer for Miss Jeannie. Uh, she's leaving when? Friday. She's leaving Friday to go to California to see some of her family. Any of your family around any of those fires? All right, she'd be in prayer for Miss Jeannie. She's going to see her family and, and uh, encourage them and try to be a witness and favor the Lord while she's there. She'd be in prayer for that. And then uh, there are a lot of folks. How about Miss Joanne? Any, any of your kids around any of the fires there around the Hollywood area or anything like that? So. So be in prayer for these folks. A lot of different things going on there. Uh, these Santa Ana winds are fueling these fires very, very quickly and spreading uh, very, very much out of control. So be in prayer for these these towns, these families affected. Amen. Just before we uh, stay this morning, we'll be turning over to John chapter 15. But before we do that, or while you're turning there, I should say, uh, if you're a veteran, if you've served our country in the past, would you stand for us this morning? Let us recognize you this Veterans Day weekend. If you've stood or if you, and Ron's back there in the back, so we'll have him stand. And so, uh, wonderful. Let's give them a hand this morning. Amen? Very, very good. And Eric, why don't you come help me just for a moment? And I'm going to have him, I'm going to hand him, remain standing just for one second. And while Eric takes these, he's going to, there are several CDs here. You can pick out the one you want to let him bring them around. But while he does that, we'll just start over here with Susan. Tell us what branch you served in and uh, how long you served. And maybe if you want to share your rank or whatever, that'd be great too. Go ahead, Miss Susan. Very good. Amen. All right, Brother Jack. I was a Navy uh, first class electrician. All right. <laughs> Very good. Amen. Brother Tom. Navy. All righty. Bob. Uh, All righty, Ron. Very good. Army back when they drafted me. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, Ron. Army. Army. All righty. Anybody over on this side? It's so all the military protecting us from this side over, right? And uh, so, uh, uh, so thank you guys and, and girls for being here. We so appreciate your service. Thank you so much for that. And if there's something we can do for you there, we want to do so. So please let us know. Uh, if you have that CD that was given to you, let us know afterwards. You can, of course, exchange that. We just want to thank you. Let's give them a hand one more time. Amen. And uh, tomorrow they will have an opportunity. Is it just tomorrow or today as well to go around and gather up some appreciation from other places tomorrow? It's both. So if you veterans, if maybe y'all can pull together after you meet with Eric, right? So we're going to get that in first. And, uh, and, uh, and you can kind of share about who's got what and where. And uh, you can go to all those places and enjoy your free cups of coffee or biscuits or hamburgers or whatever it is. And you say, well, what's the point of that? To show appreciation. Amen. Amen. And I'm thankful for our military. I'm so thankful for our military. You and I wouldn't have the freedoms we have today if we didn't have those that, as Ron shared, when they were drafted, but also now we have a 100% volunteer military. Everybody that's in is because they choose to be there. And I'm thankful for that. Yes, Ralph. Yeah, all righty. So very good. There's one of the employees right there showing appreciation. So, uh, so be sure that how many of you, this, let me say this real quick, how many of you have young people or family members that are serving now? All right, if you would, stand, tell us who they are real quickly. Tell us who's serving real quickly. All right, Eric? Uh, Harry's little brother, my little brother, Santana, he's been uh, with the U.S. Army Reserve. Very, very good. All righty. Susan? Uh, my older brother's in the Air Force, um, and five brothers. All right. <laughs> Very good. She was the rose among all the thorns is what she's trying to tell you. All right. And, uh, and Miss Cheryl? Very good. Kaylee? Right. Amen. Miss Joanne? All righty. All right. Miss Jeannie? Very, very good. And? Andrew. All righty. <laughs> Right, absolutely. And, of course, Gabriel's there as well. So let's give them a hand, amen, because when one serves, the whole family serves, right? And I want to thank you for that. Thank you so much, you veterans, those of you that have served, and be in prayer for our president as he is there today commemorating the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. And, and there's a lot of things going on there. Be in prayer for our country. Be in prayer for one another. 
and thank the Lord for our veterans. If you see, if you see one, if you see someone has served, then be sure and thank them for their service. Amen. And that'd be a great thing that we remember what price has been paid and is still being paid for our freedoms. We need to recognize that. Amen. Thank you so much. And we appreciate that and your help in doing so. John chapter 15 this morning. John chapter 15. As we hear uh, are gathered together on this Veterans Day weekend, uh, there's a text here that I wanted us to look at and I believe the Lord would bless us and use this morning. And I want to ask the Lord to help us with this. Uh, the most important message that we have is the gospel. But I say to you, God is the, not only the author of salvation and the founder of the church, but he's also the one who instituted family and government. We need to recognize that even though we may get frustrated and aggravated at times, it's God that ordained these things and put them in motion and put them in place. And we live in a world where we are becoming very divided, more so divided than probably ever before. And not only divided, but we're becoming also more divisive. We're looking for reasons to separate other than reasons to unite. We're becoming more militant in our behavior, in our mindset. We're becoming more uh, agitated. Just this past week, again, another mass shooting there. Uh, people, we are, we are battling things, and I know there's some things about the story there we don't know for certain or still investigating, but, but possibly there's a person there uh, that was facing with some post-traumatic stress issues. And then there's other reports saying that maybe he went into the military with some issues prior. And but here's my point. We were facing a generation. Yesterday I met someone. I walked up to an individual. They had this place set up, and I walked up, and I said, tell me about this. It was a retreat for veterans and for those that serve or have served in the military. It's right here in our state. It's down near Sonoida. And it's a retreat for those where they, want, they don't want to medicate you through these things. They want to encourage you to see God and, and trust the positive things that, goes, that you gather from these experiences. And I gather some information phone, and I will be looking at that and evaluating some things there. And if it's something I think that we can use and we want to promote that, it, it is provided free of cost to veterans and those who serve. And, of course, there's some guidelines and things there we want to look at. But nevertheless, I, as I spoke with this gentleman about it, he shared what, it, what they established it for. Uh, they wanted to encourage people to rely upon something other than medication to get through their difficulties. And I think we're living in a world where, as it, we've said in the past, we are definitely an over-medicated, overweight, underworked nation. Even with an, an employment at an all-time low, we're still underworked. And what I mean by that is uh, we have decided that we just want to do nothing. <laughs> when you have an unemployment rate, that just means that, that that's the measure of the people that want to work. That doesn't measure those that don't want to. We have a host of folks in our country that have chosen to live a lifestyle of mooching other than working. Reality it is, when we study the Bible, the Bible finds out that we're, there is a reward that comes with, God says that we are to enjoy the fruits of our labor. There's a principle that God puts in place to where that when you, at the end of the day, when you put something into something and you get something out of it, there's an appreciation for that. We become a very enabling nation. One of the things that I don't want to do with our church and I don't want to do with my family or my life, I don't want to become an enabling type mentality. What I mean by that is, how many of you realize that Jesus Christ died on Calvary and when he paid it, when he died on Calvary with his, shed his blood, he paid it all for all. But what we can do as a church, if we're not careful, is we can present the gospel as salvation freely, but then we will also tell people, well, now that you're saved, we can also enable them to where they don't feel like they ever have to do anything. You don't do anything for your salvation. No, absolutely, it's free. It's paid for. You have to receive it. But once a person's trusted Christ or saved, there's a responsibility that God gives us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. One of the last things he told the church, and he told five different accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, he gives us the five different accounts, the five accounts of the Great Commission, this great command, this great mission that he gave the church to do, before, just before he stepped back into glory was, he said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. He says, you're witnesses. And we need, to be a, we need to realize that we have to be a witness for Christ, okay? John chapter 15, this morning, look at verse 1. It's Christ speaking here. He says, I am the true vine, and my, father's, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch is in me that beareth not fruit. He taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth much fruit. Now you are clean through, 
uh, through the word which I have spoken unto you, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. And the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what will you do, what will ye, what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, and even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. Lord, we come to you today, we thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, I thank you for the word of God that we can hold, that we can cherish, we can read, we can ask you to speak to us through. Lord, this morning I pray that you'd help us. Lord, our churches around the globe, we have, we have gotten so lazy as far as getting out the gospel. We've gotten so lazy as far as living our life holy and separated unto you. We've gotten so lazy, Lord, in our witness. We've gotten so forgetful, Lord, that we've forgotten that we're, very, we're a part of the very family of God. Lord, help us this morning to be sparked, to be reminded, to be motivated, Lord, from the word of God that we go forth into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, teaching them all things whatsoever you've commanded us, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And Lord, in doing so, we may see Old become new. We may see new creatures spring forth, the miracle of all miracles, because the preaching is a miracle. It, it changes lives. It takes one that's dead in trespasses and trespasses in sin and makes them quickened, alive forevermore in the glory of God. Lord, I ask you now this morning to help us in this room to realize our responsibility to bear fruit and not just to be trampling the vineyard as we, as we reap a harvest, Lord, but also, Lord, that fruit right, right remain. Lord, as we bear fruit in our life through witnessing, testifying of Christ in us, Lord, that through that same message that we may see others grow thereby. And Lord, as we nourish ourselves in the word of God, Lord, we challenge you to help us this morning that you may be exalted and glorified in all that we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In John chapter 15 this morning, we have this principle. He says in verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Can I ask you a real simple question this morning? What kind of life are we living for Christ? This is not meant to be negative this morning as I, I believe we live in the greatest country in the world. I believe we have the greatest privileges, the greatest freedoms. Uh, we have the privilege in this country to come to the pulpit and take the Word of God and preach any text and any responsibility and any accountability before God. Very few nations in the world have that privilege. We can open to any portion of any text of the Bible this morning and declare the truth of that text clearly without fear of government intervention. We have the privilege of doing that. We have a nation where we allow, it's, and our nation was founded upon the principles where people have freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. We live in a nation where people can protest if they so choose. Now, they're encouraged to do so peacefully. There's consequences for doing so not peacefully. <laughs> we live in a nation, though, where people can come, and, and if you don't believe in something that's taking place, you can protest that. You can stand against that publicly. You can have your signs, you can, you can voice your opinion, you can even write an article to the paper and the, pre and the newspaper or the magazines or, or the radio or, or internet, you can publicize that. 
most nations of the world govern that. What I mean by that is they limit that, those freedoms. You can post anything you want and, and, and send it out, but the government will receive that before it goes out and they will alter that or delete that or limit that. We don't live in that nation. We have great freedoms. Those freedoms came with a great price. We have the freedoms today because those that have fought in the past. We have the freedoms today because those that are fighting today. My point is this. If we have a nation of freedom, if we have a nation that, are, that has been united and, and, and has had the opportunity to live as a nation free ever since its inception, there's never a time when our nation wasn't free. Think about that. We haven't been in bondage and out of bondage. Back in, we've never been in bondage. We've been free since the founding of our nation. On the back side of your, or on the, I should say on the inside of your bulletin, you'll have a little bit of a blog. And it, it's just some quotes from some of our founding fathers, some of those that, that serve historically. And I'll just read this here real quickly. We have no government armed in power, capable of contending in human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. That's John Adams. Catch this real quickly. Our, our society, our country is quickly becoming immoral and irreligious. As a result, they're always trying to now amend or change our Constitution. Because what is written for moral and religious people does not suit a ir immoral and irreligious people. Benjamin Franklin said, I have lived a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it is probable that an empire cannot rise without his aid. If we think that our nation is only here because of a few people founded it, we are foolish in thinking so. God enabled us, this nation, to be born. John Adams, again, wrote, Nothing is more dreaded than the national government meddling with religion. Think about this. We have the freedoms where they've never meddled in that. And then Thomas Paine in his book, Common Sense, and we need to get back to some more of that, writes, The cause of America is in great measure the cause of, an, of all mankind. Where, say some, is the, is the king of America? I'll tell you, friend, he reigns above. The king of America is not some president. Most of the nations of our world have a king or a queen, and we have a president. And the king of our nation, people say, where's, if America's so great, where's the king? Our king reigns above, Thomas Paine says. That's a great thought. One of, the reality, one of the real things that we face every day is we face opposition as a child of God. We live in a world that is very quickly becoming, we live in a nation, I should say, that's very quickly becoming anti-God. They're not anti-little g-god, they're just anti-capital g-god. They're anti the king of kings, lord of lords, Jehovah. We're becoming a nation that, that quickly wants to lay aside the things of holiness and pick up the things of humanity. Let me say to you real quick, I'm all for being humane. But when we replace salvation with only humanity, we've laid aside the most important thing. Because salvation in and of itself... It was, was shared, and the most humane thing that was ever done was Christ died at Calvary so that no human being would ever have to die and go to hell. When we, lay, lay, when we lay aside the gospel only to reach the physical needs and neglect the spiritual needs, we've laid aside the most important thing that we can do with our life. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. Our nation is free today because some in the past said this nation's worth fighting for. I will guarantee you, just like today's military and today's armed forces, there are some that serve that don't agree with the decisions of our president and our government. That has been the case every generation. But yet they still donned the uniform, they still went to battle, they still fought for this country. Even if they disagreed with some decisions this country was making, they still fought for this country to maintain the freedoms and religion, and freedom of religion and press and speech that we have. To maintain the fact that, that we're a nation of all nations, we, we have been historically the superpower of the world. Not just a superpower, we have been the superpower. So let me, what do you mean by that? How many of you remember the Soviet Union? How many remember the Soviet Union? You were a child of a few years ago if you did, right? Because was it the early 80s? I think it was dissolved. Is that, is, am I remembering that right? I think it was under Ronald Reagan's administration when, they, when it was dissolved, right? Or was it Jimmy Carter? I think it was Ronald Reagan, right? And... Uh, 
Think about this real quickly. There was a time when there was other nations that, that joined forces to become a power that they thought they could overtake this one nation. There was a time when the Soviet Union, there was a union of people that said, we are going to unite to overtake this one nation. And even in their uniting, they could not overtake this nation. Now, thank God for our military. But thank God. Because it was God who sustained us. Then the Soviet Union dissolved. And now, of course, Russia is on the scene. Russia will always be on the scene, by the way. You find the bear listed in the very, some of the last things that the Bible ever records for us. You find the bear still in play. When we live in our world, we live in a world that's becoming, we live in a nation, I should say, I mean, that is becoming very quickly anti-God. We're coming into a time where, where God becomes only the name of God used if it becomes a popularity thing. Instead of being a conviction, it becomes a tool. People claim religion or claim God only if they think it will advance their humanistic mindset. It should not be that way. Christ says here, I am the true vine and my father the husband. He says, what it boils down to is this. He says, you cannot bear fruit unless you be in me. I thought much about that. And I started to bring some things up and illustrate it this morning, but you can do this in your mind's eye. We put a little arrangement here on the table to kind of commemorate this time of year. We may even add to it. Who knows? This time of year is often known as harvest season, right? You see it taking place with the cotton right around this right now. If you were in an area where you had a garden that was grown all summer long, this would be time of year where a lot of those things would be harvested for the last month or so, and now they'd be harvesting off those different things, whether it be uh, gourds or whether it be the corn, whatever, you'd be harvesting off those things. As a result of that, it's, it's harvest season, and, and you enjoy the, the blessings of harvest. In the springtime, you, you may, or in the, maybe if you live in a cold environment or somewhere like that, in, in the wintertime, the fall before, you may plow the ground so that the water could get into the ground better. So during the freeze of the winter, it would break up the ground, and it wouldn't be so hard, it wouldn't be so, it wouldn't be so fallow, it'd break up that fallow ground. And then, as it sat there all winter long, the moisture would soak into the ground, the freezing and the thawing, and the freezing would break it up. And so in the springtime, you could take a plow or a disc, and you could run through the ground again, and it would break, and it would break easier, become more suitable for planting. And then you would take, and you would maybe uh, lay it off. You would lay off some rows, and you would, you would till the ground. You'd make it even finer instead of a clod, and it would be, it would be fine dirt. And, and then you would take, and you'd, go to the, and you'd maybe go to the seed store, and you'd buy some seed. And depending on what month, it would depend on what seed, and you would prepare that ground. If you were going to plant some things, you may make a hill or a mound. Some things you would poke a hole and drop the seed in. Some things you would lay out a row and you'd drop the seed in. And some things you would cover up barely, and some things you'd cover up an inch, whatever, depending on the type of seed. And you plant the seed, and you, and you watch it, and you watch that ground. It's just a brown dirt. But you went and spent maybe $15, $20, or $100 on seed. And you put that seed in that ground. And you watched it. And you walked up there the next day, and it still looked like it did the day before. A day or two later, you walk up there again, and you, some of it looks like it did the day before. Now you start seeing every now and then a little green thing starts to poke up, and you say, Is that a weed? <laughs> so you give it two or three days, and you look at it again, and you see if it's in a row or if it's just like this, you know? And you, then you determine. My wife and I ha used to have a garden, and I was working a ton of hours. One time I said, hey, I need you to weed the garden. Just weed the corn for me. It would just come up, you know, it was like this tall, maybe four or five inches tall or something like that. It would just come up. I said, go out there and weed it before, because it will start choking it really quickly, you know, when it's young like that. But I come home from work, and I walked out in the garden the next day or two, and I walked around, and there's no corn. I said, where's the corn? She said, what corn? And she weeded the corn. <laughs> she thought the corn was weeds. It looked very much the same when it's very immature like that. And, and as a result of that, in its immaturity, it looked just like the grass that would grow up. And, and she didn't, I said, if it was in a row, you should have left it. But that's okay. <laughs> That'll be next year. And, uh, you know, <laughs> she left some, just not all. Here's my point. We have reaped a mighty harvest in our country because of what was the price that was paid 
and the lives that, that were given in decades gone by. And yet now today we are, and don't please don't get me wrong, we've got a powerful military, an all-volunteer military. But I'm afraid through our animosity, through our selfishness, through our lack of information, through our stupidity, that we are trampling the harvest that we've been reaping. I'm afraid now we have more people going into the military not sure what they're fighting for, and therefore, when they get out, they don't know what they fought for. And please, those of you veterans, I'm so thankful. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We've got several people from our church, or at least attached to our church, to family members, like you heard earlier, that are serving, and I'm so thankful for that. We got more people that are fighting and combating and protesting what's going on through our military. And yet, you do realize because of the media and the internet and social, they see the same things that we see. And how many people do you see holding up signs praising our military versus how many people you hold up signs condemning our military? And they see that. And, they, and sometimes, no doubt, their mind probably wonders, what, 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 what's the point of fighting for this country? They don't even appreciate what we're doing anyway. They don't even want us here. What's the point of fighting for this country? And some of them, no doubt, get out with a, an attitude that doesn't suit what it should have been because of the privilege they had to serve and pretend, pr protect and defend a nation. We need to teach our young people what we have as a nation. We teach them that the privilege that they have was a privilege that someone else paid for. Christ says here, as he speaks, he says, listen, I am the vine. You're the branches. A person that goes into the military that doesn't know what they're fighting for will not get out of the military often any more educated than they went in. Oh, they'll know how to fight. They just don't know what they're fighting for. Because they never were really taught and trained and showed what this country stood for. What's been handed to them. Catch this real quickly. Christ says here concerning the church, He says, unless you are in me, you will bear no fruit. One of the most frustrating and aggravating things that all of us would ever endure is not only the mass shootings across our country, but it, it, it strikes a special chord of hurt to my heart when I hear it's a former military person that did that. It's like, what? This is the person that, and now we've even had some shootings that's taken place on bases. It's like, what? I know there are some psychological things. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I can't help but wonder sometimes if, if they had just been shown if they'd just been taught from an early age, if they'd have just been experienced and, and, and taught to show appreciation and, and, sh and people had showed appreciation for our country, if they, maybe they'd have viewed it a little bit differently. I don't know what I'm fighting for anyway. So let me say to you this morning, do you know Christ is your Savior? How many of you ever gotten frustrated? Brother Strickland pastored up in Phoenix for 19 years. I think that's right. And then back in Alabama or Missouri. Where'd you pastor? Alabama. Alabama. I knew it was one of those places of misery. And, uh, but, uh, but he pastored back there for a few years prior to coming to Arizona. But here's my point. Catch this real quickly. Brother Strickland can tell you, along with others, it can be super frustrating sometimes. I mean, you, you hand tracks out, and you hand tracks out, and you hand tracks out, and you talk to people, and you counsel people, and you spend time on the phone, and all of a sudden, it's like you, you did this for them, and they don't care. You tell them what Christ did for them, and they say, yeah, I don't need that. And you're going, yes, you do. You just don't realize what you need. <laughs> you don't realize what you have, and it's offering of a free gift of salvation. You can't get this anywhere else. You ever seen a commercial on television? Not sold in any stores. You can only get it here. You know where you get salvation? Christ and Christ alone. You can't get it anywhere else. You can't get it through works or church membership or baptism. It's Christ and Christ alone. Those that serve our country have often gone in realizing they volunteered, by the way. And I know a lot of people volunteer for different reasons. And they join a lot of times because our military makes it possible for them to get an education and, 
and they go to college, and I'm thankful for this, and I'm thankful for that. If a person's willing to serve our country for three or five or however many years to get some money to go to college on, then praise God, I'm thankful for that. But sometimes I'm afraid they go in with the goal of getting money to go to school and not a goal of protecting our nation. Those can go hand in hand, but we should not neglect what we're fighting for just to get rewarded. There should be a reason that we fight. There should be a reason that we fight. So this morning, as a church, we're going to move through this. As a church, do you realize what you have in Christ? Do you realize what you have in Christ? You can't get it anywhere else but in Christ. Your salvation to, tomorrow will be 40 years I've been in Christ. 40 years tomorrow, November 12, 1978. November 12, 1978. You, know, you ever heard that date before? November 12, 1978. 40 years. I can't get anywhere else. I couldn't have got anywhere else. Christ and Christ alone. So for me to say, well, you know, but that was really good once upon a time. It's no less today than it was then. He's still on the throne today, just like he was then. He still has all knowledge, all power, just like he did then. He's still in the saving business, just like he was then. He still lives inside of me, just like he moved in that night. He still wants to guide me. Look, look at a couple of verses real quickly. The Bible says in verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you. Do you see that? And that your joy might be full. Here's two things he says about joy here. He says, one, first of all, he says, if you abide in me, <laughs> I'm having to paraphrase for time, I read the whole text earlier, so we can go back and look at it on your own, but he says, if you abide in me, you're going to get something done. Is that what he says? You're going to bear fruit. If you abide in me, you're going to bear some fruit. This is the time of year in Arizona to where the mesquites are dropping some of their fruit. There are beans and things. You know, how many of you have a mesquite tree in your yard? How many of you wish you didn't? And uh, so uh, yeah, Rick's about delimbed all of his so they wouldn't have any fruit to drop. And, uh, but uh, but they, they drop their beans. The Palo Verdes drop their little needles, you know, and, and it's just like, you know why they're dropping it? Not to be a nuisance. They're dropping it because the tree is hoping to bear more fruit. You know how the, truth, the, bear, the tree is going to bear more fruit? It's going to drop its seed. Until the seed is dropped, the tree cannot reproduce itself. Next question. If Christ is in you, and he desires to bear fruit through you, the Bible says here's the two things about, about bearing fruit. If, we, if we'll remain in him, if we'll abide in him, if we'll, if we'll stick with him, and we'll realize he's in us and we're with him, and we'll serve the Lord with our life, the Bible says this. Look, look, at, look at this again, because it's, it's an amazing thing about joy. He says... Verse 11, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might, might remain in you. Here's the amazing thing about joy. I love this text. I love this verse. Christ says, you want to make me happy? How many of you like to make the Lord happy? How many of you want to just go break his heart today? All you can, right? How many of you want to make the Lord happy? You know what the Bible says how to make him happy? Bear fruit. But you can't bear fruit unless you abide in him. You, you can't go out on your own. I started to kind of illustrate this morning with some things. I was going to have some guys, and I was going to bring something up here, and I was going to bring some boards, and I was going to put them together, and we were going to put together a picture of something, like whether it be the, the outline of a house or whatever. I was going to give you, and I was going to have everybody holding up a corner of it or a spot, or, and I was going to have everyone doing something. And that picture was going to be together in Christ. There's something that gets done. Then I was going to have someone just like drop your corner. And no matter how much this corner, this corner, and this corner may try, if this person drops their corner, the structure is not going to be there. There may be a form of a structure or the former form of a structure, but it's not going to be like it was. So we may do all kinds of things in religion, and we have a world, we have a world for religious people. And we have a nation full of religion. All kinds of things are done with religion in mind. Religion in mind. But very little is being done with Christ. I know. You say, well, wait a minute, I, there's all kinds of things. Here's the question. Remember how we could go through and harvest, but trample the field as we harvested it? 
I'm afraid today there are some things that's done, and they use the name of Christ, but they bear no fruit as a result. Oh, they go through, and, 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 there may, and they, may, they may present the gospel, but, but, what, but the way they present the gospel and the, way, and the area that the way they do things, there's no one going to come after them that can harvest anything because there's the, the, the garden's been trampled down, the vineyard's been trampled down. Catch this real quickly. First of all, the Lord says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, he says, my joy remain in you. You can make me really, really happy if you'll serve me with your life, if you'll remain in me. And only that, he says, my joy, the joy that I have, is going to be in you. If you make me happy, I'll make you happy. You know what the Bible says? Because the Bible uses a family, uses marriage, a relationship between a husband and wife as a picture of Christ and the church. You know what the Bible says about that relationship? It says that the husband hateth not his own body, but loveth it and cherisheth it. And the Bible goes on to say this, that if we love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave us sin for it, the Bible says that we do good unto ourselves. Catch this, guys. This is a tough lesson. When we make our wives happy, we're happy. I mean, think about that. When they smile, it's more likely that we smile. Is that what the Bible says? Christ says this. Here in John chapter 15, he says, listen, abide in me. Do what I ask you to do. I called you friends, not servants. The servant don't know what the master, the servant just knows what they're told to do, but they don't know why the master makes the choice. Just do it. He said, I didn't call you servants. I called you friends. He said, you have all the information. You know why you're to do it. You know why it's being done. I share information with you. He says, I don't share with my servants. You have me living in you. Catch this real quickly. He says, you make me happy. I'm going to, in turn, help you be happy. Notice what he says at the end of that, at the second part of that verse. He says, that my joy may be in, remain in you, but he says, and that your joy might be full. It's not just the fact that you'll be happy sometimes. You're going to be full of joy. I mean, you're going to be full of joy. There's going to be days when everybody else is going to say, well, are you grinning at? You're going to be grinning sometimes. Somebody's going to say, why are you so happy? I'm just thinking. You're going to catch yourself smiling and don't even know you're smiling. Really. Because the Bible said not only will you make the Lord happy and He'll in turn bring His happiness into your life, your joy, His joy in you, but He says your joy will be full. Here's the amazing thing about that. There's things in this world that we say, that brings me great happiness. But there's very few things that the world promotes that causes us to be joyful. There's a difference in happiness and joyful. Joyful means, joyful literally is derived from rejoice. Those two words have a relationship. In other words, there has to, you don't, it's not just something that, that you're, all oh, right. Cool. No. That's happy. Joy means, wow, somebody was thinking of me. Someone gave me this. Someone was thinking of me. Someone paid for something. Someone did something thinking of me. That's joy. When's the last time you experienced that? When's the last time you helped someone experience that? Some of you, <coughs> on occasion, will maybe drop me a note or shoot me a text, and, and you'll say some very nice, maybe not true, but some very nice things to me. I know this sounds a little bit like, it's like, wow. They were thinking of me. I mean, they purposely, they didn't send it, oh, that wasn't supposed to go to you. No, they, that wasn't the next text, you know. You ever got one of those before, right? I sent some out this week, right? And, uh, but, uh, sorry, wrong person, you know. And, uh, but they actually purposely chose an address or a phone number and sent a text or left a message or sent a card, and wrote a card, what, handed a card, whatever, and, and said some, it's like, wow. They were thinking of me. 
we, our society has shifted, and I'm going to meddle just for a second. Our society has shifted very quickly to where now at Christmas time, if you participate in giving gifts, that's your choice. But if you do so, we move to a society where it just becomes, well, here's a gift card for you, and 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 we just do gift cards because it's so easy. Some of you are grinning at me because you do that, don't you? I'm not mad at you. I'm not. Some of you will give my wife gift cards several times through the year to her favorite restaurant, and you know what? That means you're thinking of her because you gave her a specific gift card to a specific place that you know she enjoyed. But if we just go buy like a generic, like an Amazon gift card, or a, we say, here, get whatever you want, that is so unattached. Well, I gave them something, so what's your purpose? Just so you can say you gave them something? I'm not being unkind or nasty, please. I'm wrecking Christmas for everyone, right? <laughs> Young people, you will not be getting any gift cards this Christmas. Blame me, all right? Here's my point. When someone thinks of you, it's not just cool. It's, wow, they was thinking of me. This is personalized. My wife, yesterday as we left, we went up to the racetrack yesterday and watched the race, and on our way back, she said, you're picking where we're eating supper. I said, no, you choose. She said, no, you're choosing. So I started going to a certain direction. She said, where are you going? And I said, I'm not telling. <laughs> she said, you're going to Wingstop, aren't you? Because I love wings. I said, no, I'm not going to Wingstop. She said, it would be fine because she don't like hot wings. So she just orders them plain, like she's just eating chicken there, you know, and paying way too much for it. And, uh, but uh, but, she, she said, but she, I said, no, I'm not going to Wingstop. She said, I'd be fine if you go to Wingstop. I said, I'm not going to Wingstop. Well, where are you going? I said, I'm not telling. And until we was in front of the place, I didn't tell her. We went to El Pollo Loco, if you want to know. <laughs> Say, big deal. She likes El Pollo Loco. And I thought of it when I thought of her. Oh. Uh, <laughs> catch this real quickly. When I think of her, I want to please her. If I'd have went to Wingstop, I'd have went after me. But I think of her, I want to please her. That's rejoicing, that's joy. Even though she said, well, we can stop. I would have went to Wingstop if you didn't want to go there. She's thinking of me, but I got the pick. So she got the joy. Because I was thinking of her. Catch this real quick. A little silly illustration. What's the last time that you've helped someone to be joyful? When you gave them something personal, something personalized. It don't have to be something you buy. It can be a text. It can be a message. It can be a card. When's the last time you literally just hugged someone's neck and said, I just, I, I really, I want to just say thank you. I just want to tell you I love you. And it wasn't like, oh, love you too. No. I mean, you personally slowed down, stopped, and gave them something that was for them. The Bible says of Christ, if we'll abide in him, not only will we bear fruit, but we'll bear fruit that remains. And if we do so, that his joy will be in us. What makes him happy now will make us happy, but not only that, but our joy will be full. We will know that someone's thinking of us. Him. Notice the next verse real quickly here. He says in verse 12, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life, notice this, for his servants. That's not what it says. Friends. What's he say earlier? I have not called you servants. The servant don't know what the master doeth. I've called you friends. No greater life, no greater love, I mean. No greater love hath any man that they can give than to lay down their life for their friends. Catch this real quickly. It's Veterans Day weekend. No, it's not Memorial Day. It's Veterans Day. But do you realize that just like every week that goes by, this will be no different. There will be some that had went off to serve our country that this week will come home to their family and friends not walking or talking 
in a coffin, in a casket. Just like every week of our nation, there's a military person buried that died on the battlefield. They gave their life for this country. We call it the ultimate sacrifice. Let me ask you a question real quickly. So where are you at today in your life with, with your walk with the Lord? They're serving the country. They're giving their life. And one of the great people that, of our state, I should say, but Pat Tillman, you know, was a, was a, played for ASU, went off to be a, a professional football player and was a great one. And, and yet he got affected in his heart for the need of those to defend our country and left his professional career as a very well-paid athlete to go and serve in our country. And there, while serving, was killed. Now, I know it was by friendly fire, but nevertheless, his life, he lost his life in defense of our country. Catch us real quickly. So where are we at in our life? The Bible says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, not only will you bear fruit, but you'll bear fruit that remains. When's the last time you bore fruit that remained? When's the last time that you poured yourself into someone to the point where they're still around? They're still there. When's the last time that, that you tried to spend some time with somebody to encourage them? Whether it be a phone call, whether it be a text, whether it be a card, whether it be whatever, a visit knock, uh, uh, with them, a, a trip somewhere, whatever. But you spent some time and you just said, I just wanted to call and just say, hey man, I had you on my mind and my heart. This morning I sent a text, or I mean an email out to Brother Starr. He had sent me an email early this morning, 7 o'clock this morning, uh, letting it give me an update about his cancer surgery. He had his surgery yesterday, everything went great. He got out of the hospital yesterday evening. He should be checking out, or this morning, whatever, checking out and going home today. Headed back home today. I sent a reply back. I said, thank you so much for thinking about us and that we're giving us this progress report. I mean that. This is my friend. And the fact that he thought of me and thought of our church is a big deal. When he got back from their trip to overseas, Australia and the Philippines, he called me the next day. He called me the next day. He said, I just want you to know, Brother O, I, we're back in the States. Tell you about our trip, man. It's great. I thought, wow, that's a friend. This guy knows thousands of people. He's in hundreds of churches a year. And he calls me. That's a friend. When's the last time we did that to someone? That we gave up some of our life for them as their friend. That we're, some of our schedule, some of our time, some of our thoughts for them. Notice what it says in verse 14. You're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants. Look at verse 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. He says, you want to see God work in your life? Then please me with your life. Because if you please me with your life, it's amazing what I'm going to give you to do with. One of the amazing things about churches is, when someone is starting a church or whatever, as they can talk about it, they can promote it, they can go around and visit their church and raise support. And as, as long as people see them doing something, they will give. I mean, like, brother, I want to help you with this, I want to help you. But then all of a sudden they find out they're doing nothing. They say, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give to them anymore. If, you know, uh, we've, we invested all that money in them in the past. And you know what, they, they've, 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 they've done nothing with it. They, they, seem to, they don't seem to even care. And, and with our life, it's no different. Our, our, we invest our lives in our kids and our grandkids and our, our spouses, and, and, and we invest our lives in them. And all of, sometimes, because we don't recognize what we have in them and in being involved in our life, we don't invest like we should. Oh, we give them things, but they misbehave, and we end up just rewarding bad behavior. Christ says, that's not what I'm going to do. Christ says, you abide in me, I in you. Not only will I give you fruit, but fruit will remain. And not only this, notice what he says as he closes this out. But he says in verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you, he says at the end of that verse. Wow, look how much they're doing. I want to be involved in that. 
Really? I want to be involved in that. One of the amazing things that, that this church is great about is your generosity. I was thinking about this just the other day. We should have already probably promoted this, but we'll do it here in a few days. But we've given several hundreds of those military Bible sticks and sent them to our military. You know why we was able to do that? Because you gave. Because you purchased them. And we could put them in the hands of the chaplains, and chaplains could in turn give them to those that serve in the military. They could take the Bible with them anywhere they are. On a little MP3 player with earbuds. It comes with a battery, comes with a Bible reading chart, and it has a little memory stick so they can even put some pictures of their family and things and take them with them so if they're on a computer they can download those and keep them. And you've bought them. We've hit hundreds of those out. We have a little plaque somewhere back in the office, probably on the shelf. You sit out front commend, commending our church on how much our church had given towards that. You know what helps you, what helps us give? Well, we know we're giving to something. You know what Christ says about our life? He says, I'm, if you're doing something, if you're bearing fruit and there's fruit remaining, you know what I'm going to do? He said, I'm going to give you anything you ask in my name. That's what, is that what verse 16 says, the end of the verse? He says, if you're going to use it for my glory, then I own the hill, the cattle on the hill, and the wealth, never mind. I own it all. If you're going to do something for the glory of God, then I'm going to give you something to do with. <laughs> I'm investing in something that's reaping eternal rewards, God says. If you're going to do it, if you're going to ask it of your own lust, that you may conceive it of your own lust, then you're not, going to get, you're not going to get what I'm going to give you. Have you ever heard the phrase, if you're spending my money, you're spending it in the way that I want you to? My kids kind of know that rule at our house. Dad, can I have this? Why do you want it for? No, you ain't getting the money. What? You spend my money, you spend it the way I want it. That way I have to be. Yep, it has to be approved by me. Spend your money, it's your choice. Spend my money, you have to spend it the way it's approved by me. Really? That's what God says. He says, whatever you ask in my name, if you're using it for, doing it for my glory, if we're going to be fruit, that fruit remains, you're going to bear much fruit, and that fruit remains, if you're going to do it for my glory, he says, I'm going to give you whatever you ask in my name. If you're spending it to please me, to bring my joy and to bring joy to me, then I'm going to in turn give that your joy may be full, and I'm going to give you more because you will not run out of the ability to please me, he says. You may run out of the ability to please yourself, but you will not be denied the ability to please me, God says. I am so thankful that we, we, have, we live in a country where our military goes into the military and their vehicles are provided, their uniforms are provided, their weapons are provided, their ammunition is provided. I'm thankful for that. How sad of a country, how sad of, a, of armed forces will we have if they had to go in and provide their own clothing, their own guns, their own ammunition, their own tanks, their own vehicles? We wouldn't be a superpower at all, would we? Well, you say, I, I know people's got thousands of rounds of ammo. They'll burn through that in practice, sharpening their skills. By the way, us Tennessee people can relate to this. You know one of the things that cost the South the battle in the Civil War? They didn't have the funding to properly equip their soldiers. It was kind of a ragtag bunch of people for the most part. Now, Brother Strickland will say, the South is going to rise again. We did. We went to the North. And, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but here's the point. Catch this. I'm so thankful our military can serve and go in, and, and when they get there, they, they know that they can be equipped for the battle. Hey, wait a minute. Ephesians chapter 6 reminds us that we're in a spiritual warfare every day. And he says, by the way, I'm providing for you all that you need for that warfare. Equip yourselves properly. Dress the part of the Christian soldier, he says. Behave yourself like a Christian soldier. He says as a result of that, we just sang the song, we'll be on the winning side. We've, lived in a, we've moved in a society where now we expect our military to be provided for, but we forget that we're in God's army. We, he, he is the author of all things, the inventor 
the inventor. The creator of all things, the Bible says. Catch this. And yet we feel like, well, I just can't serve the Lord with my life. Are you in the vine this morning? How, are you the limb? This is what he says in this text. He says, listen, if you don't abide in me, what's going to happen is I'm going to cut you off and you're just going to be laying there on the ground dead. Dead. You're going to look a whole lot like the vine. You just won't be bearing any fruit. You have the resemblance of the vine. You once could say, well, I, I used to be part of the fruit-bearing vine. But you're not bearing fruit anymore. You just lie there with a miserable life. No one walks by and says, boy, look at that dead branch. No. There's no joy in living your life. You're just miserable. He said, but abide in me. Not only will I be joyful, but your joy will be full. And I will give you fruit and fruit that remains. And catch this real quickly. And anything you ask in my name, I will give it you. Be careful with that. Because the, the Bible goes on to say that if you ask according to your own lust, of your own desires, you may consume it if you own your own desires, your own lust. Yeah, but you don't know what I'd want to be. That's, that's exactly the wrong thing. Well, I'm just going to serve God with my life. That's the wrong thing that's glorifying you. God, may you be exalted through my life. Don't make me a great preacher. Lord, allow me, allow me to be a great preacher. Don't make me in anything that will exalt or glorify me. Allow me to serve you. Or I want to be a soul winner. I want to be the one that, that, that brings more people to church than anybody else. Check your heart when you say that. Is it because you want people to recognize you for what you're doing or do you, want, you just want people to come to know Christ? Because it's if you ask it of my, of my desires, is I'll give you anything you want. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning.